Hello everybody and welcome back to Promise Gaming, and I have another old strategy game that I enjoyed as a kid. This time we're going to play Rise of Nations. I loved this game growing up. It might even be my favorite strategy game. So many hundreds of hours that I put into these uh, Conquer the World campaigns. I mean, you had Alexander the Great, Napoleon, the New World, the Cold War. That was a particularly cool scenario. Lots of really good stuff. Oh, so good. It's kind of a weird mix between a strategy game and civilization. I'll show you what I mean. Let's go into a solo game and do a quick battle here. Now, every single nation in the game does uh, start off with some special bonuses. They could be uh, economic, scientific, military bonuses, and so on. Kind of like in Civilization in that, w in that way. Uh, I think we're going to go ahead and play as um, the Dutch. Partly because I am Dutch by heritage, but also because I like commerce, and the Dutch are really good at that. Of course, my color has to be orange. Everything else here looks okay. All right, let's get started. Oh my gosh, the graphics are actually halfway decent. Holy crap! Extended edition, everybody. It actually makes the game bearable. Not bad at all. What's this? Silk! Oh, okay. Reduce the cost of commerce research, that's really nice. What a great start. Playing as a Dutch, we do start off with some merchants, so there are unique resources throughout the map. They give you various different perks, and you can use merchants to take advantage of them. We get a nice early bonus. I'm a big fan of that. Now, Rise of Nations is your typical RTS in the sense that you are training up your citizens, your military, you're gathering up different resources. Uh, it could be food, could be lumber, wealth, oil, metal, so on and so forth. One of the things that's a little bit different about the game, though, is uh, there are actually four different levels of research before you can advance the ages. You have your military, your civic, your commerce, and your science. The way that that works is military increases your population, unlocks new military units, uh, new buildings, and so on. That's pretty nice. Civics is interesting because it expands your national borders, which is important, and also allows you to found more cities. Cities are a way of expanding your national borders, and in that sense, there's actually some similarity to civilization and how you extend your presence throughout the map. Commerce is something I undervalued a lot as a kid, but now that I play the game again, I'm realizing how powerful this actually could become. Um, there's an efficiency cap to your resources. If you look at the top left, you can see that I have plus 100. That means that uh, the most resource I can ever get in one minute is 100. If I create a whole bunch of farms, for example, and theoretically had 120 food per minute, uh, I would still be capped out at 100. You can increase that limit by getting more commerce. So it actually helps re uh, increase the cap of your economy. Commerce is very important in that way. Science is pretty good too. Science would allow us to um, get new buildings that uh, increase our economy. I'm going to go ahead and settle a city over here by the mountain, by the way. This looks like a pretty good location. Uh, science allows us to get new technology that would increase the efficiency and power of our econ uh, economic buildings, such as improving your farms, improving your smelting techniques, and so on. It also gives you a cost reduction for all other research. Because, well, if you're very scientifically minded, science flows naturally and new developments will come. Hey, look, there's a ruin. Another thing that's similar to civilization. Yoink! 50 food. Sweet. Now, you can advance through the ages, which is what I'm going to do right now. There are several different ages in the game, like eight in total to represent different stages of human development. So right now we're in the Ancient Age, and we're researching the Classical Age. And then you get something like the Medieval, the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, the Industrial, the Modern, and the Information Age, or something like that. You know, either way. As you continue to advance, though, your civilization starts looking a little bit different, as we're about to see right about now. Well, actually, I take that back. That didn't really change our aesthetic. But you'll see how we advance later. It looks... It looks a lot better. But as you advance through the ages, you can access more levels of technology, which give you new buildings and more perks, expand throughout the map, and so on and so forth. It's a great game of uh, managing economics while also exploring and really advancing your civilization and trying to just defeat everybody else. It's just, it's just a good game. Such a good game. Now, we're building a dock over here. One thing I actually want to do is build a university. Universities allow you to train up some scholars who gather knowledge, and once you get to the classical age, now, knowledge is pretty much required for all technological advancement. So we're going to get a university pretty early on, and I'm probably going to have one in every city that I found, just so I can get as much knowledge as possible. I'll become very smart with a big, big brain, and then uh, we'll just use our technological advantage to destroy everyone in our path. It'll be glorious. Ah, see, now we're at the food commerce cap. We have plus 100 food per minute. That's the most we can do. Building more farms will do nothing. So I'm going to go ahead and build... This woodcutter camp sucks. Build one down here, maybe? There we go, five citizens. Okay, maximum of five there based on how many trees are in its radius. That'll work for me. Yeah, there's no point in getting more food right now until we get more commerce research. Which I will work on, but first we're going to need a bit of knowledge, which means I have to train some scholars. I really want this commerce cap because now we're capped out on our food and our wood. Um, we can research taxation at the temple now, though. 
That's pretty good. That generates a fair amount of wealth, and it increases... Wow, that's a good mine. It increases based on how much presence you have on the map. Right, your national borders are over half the planet? Well, there's a lot of people, theoretically, you could tax. So, if you're going to go for a wealth playthrough, you really want to have a strong presence. Hey, look, Obsidian. Cool, okay, extra attack for archers, towers, forts, and cities. Really good for the early game defense. Also, Citrus. I don't really care if ships can heal uh, automatically at sea, because I think we only have, like, a small lake, but... We'll pick it up anyway, because at the very least, it's worth some extra uh, wood and food. Which is well worth it, in my opinion. Alright, let's finally get this commerce stuff, because I'm capped out on all the resources I care about. No! I, I need to improve my economy, and the Dutch do have some nice bonuses to commerce. So do the British, actually. Um, there's, very, there's a lot of different types of civilizations in this game. You're going to find some that really excel at early aggression. Some that are very defensive, like Russia, for example, can have uh, really powerful attrition for all enemies within their borders and just kind of kill them off naturally. That's pretty good, too. The Germans have an incredibly good industry. So do the Dutch have really good commerce, which ends up being pretty good industry. I mean, there's just a lot of stuff to like. Every nation's slightly different in the play style. And I love that about this game. We're going to go ahead and build a lumber mill. And the way that the lumber mill works is it increases the efficiency of, uh, or at least the resource gathering, of all woodcutters within the city by 20%. So, you know, if you have a lot of uh, woodcutters in one particular city and you build a lumber mill, hey, look, that's going to give you a huge benefit. It's actually pretty nice. Now, unfortunately, you are capped out with five farms per city. So uh, you really are going to get capped out on food production pretty quick unless you continue expanding and getting more cities, which we might want to do pretty soon. But you could also build a granary, and it does the exact same thing as a lumber mill and makes every city a little bit more efficient. That's pretty nice. I want to get a smelter, but, uh, well, we, we can't until we get to the next stage, or at least until we have some more scientific research. I think I'm going to go ahead and found another city over here somewhere. Oh, wait, we need more civics. Of course. Let's go ahead and research Civic Level 2 Empire. In the very top right, you can see my um, my city population limit or whatever. Well, okay, population is 46 out of 75. Cities are 2 out of 2. So by getting this next civic research, we actually will be able to uh, get another city founded, which means more farms and so on. Also, we might as well just go ahead and get started on the medieval age, right? Yeah, I don't see why not. Placing your cities is kind of important. You do want to be close to uh, a lot of trees, close to a mountain if you can, uh, just for the sake of its economic radius. Like, this is kind of sucky. You have to build within your borders, but it's kind of the best I can do. Oh, well, it'll be an open city. We can have some farms and stuff. Um, but the important thing is it's going to expand my borders quite a bit, which I can then use to found cities in more profitable locations. Hey, we're at the medieval age. Well ahead of our opponents, too. That's actually pretty good. Oh, the Turks just became a republic. Interesting. Uh, we may want to get a government of our own, actually. We can build a senate. And the way that this is going to work is you'll get to choose between one of two different government types. You can be either a despot or a republic. And they'll give you different bonuses. Uh, republics tend to be more defensive in nature and focus a lot on the economy. Uh, despots tend to focus a lot on military and early game expansion. Now, you can switch partway through, right? So you start off as a despot or republic, and the next tier, which I think begins at, like, the... Um, Enlightenment age or something, you can either become a democracy or a monarchy, and you can switch. If you were a republic, you can become a monarchy if you want. That's okay. And then later, and I think it's the modern age, you choose between communism and capitalism. And of course, everything just gives you more and more stacking bonuses. Let's go ahead and start finally building out some military buildings. I'll get myself a barracks to start, maybe a couple of them. Um, I do tend to focus a lot on infantry in this game. Uh, not usually as much cavalry, but really strong infantry and uh, artillery tends to beat everything in its path. It's a pretty good strategy. You'll see. Oh, the Turks have reached the medieval age. Okay. Well, they're starting to catch up with me. I can already tell that Suleiman is going to be a problem. I actually really like the Turks in this game because they have very good uh, artillery. You know? Uh, the Turkish bombards and stuff that they're famous for? Yeah. It's pretty good. Did I mention there are wonders in this game? Like, we can build a Colossus right now. That's not so bad. Each uh, wonder gives you some different bonuses. It takes a while to build. Um, other opponents can build them before you and actually stop your production. So, like, everyone now knows that I started building the Colossus. They could outrace me if they wanted to. Another thing that's kind of similar to Civilization. Really, I'm not kidding when I say Rise of Nations. is like the perfect fusion of uh, all the features you love in Civilization coupled into a really nice RTS. It's just such a good game. You know, one of the things that's just killing me right now is I recognize all of this music. Like, it's all coming back to me right now. Oh my gosh. I, I listened to this music for so many hours. I bet I could start singing along. There's going to be like some bagpipes or something. Yeah, that's not a bagpipe. You know what I mean, though? It's, it's, it's either that or it's a very high-pitched bagpipe. I don't know what it is. There's a name for it. But I'm not kidding. <laughs> it's just it's triggering all the childhood memories. 
Oh my gosh! I love it! Hey, let's become a republic. I do tend to focus down the republic route, partly because, well, I mean, I'm, I'm just sort of naturally democratic in nature, but two, because I do tend to focus a lot on early game defense and economy until I can just outproduce my opponents. And once I have that, then I tend to go early aggression. Hmm, looks like the Lakota have access to furs and bears and stuff. Well, here's the fun thing about the Dutch. Uh, we have armed merchants and caravans. That's one of our features. So if we can set up, my merchant will kill the other merchant, and we'll get the furs. It's probably a good way to provoke the Lakota, but... I mean, if I get the furs and he doesn't, that sounds like a very Dutch thing to do. I say that as if I have any idea what I'm talking about. I may be, uh, I may be a no small part Dutch and German by nature, but that doesn't mean that I actually know anyone who's Dutch. I have no idea what the national stereotypes are supposed to be. I shall learn these things one of these days. But it is not this day. Alright, so Lakota are just now reaching the uh, Medieval Age. We're going to go ahead and get started on the Gunpowder Age. Now what's going to happen here is you're going to see a major tech switch uh, as far as our military units. So we haven't gotten it yet, I haven't actually trained any, but right now you can imagine at this stage of the game, it's mostly archers, crossbowmen, uh, halberdiers, swordsmen, so on and so forth. Once you get to Gunpowder though, all of your melee infantry can be upgraded into Gunpowder units. Everything suddenly becomes ranged, which is a really important advantage to have over your opponents. If they're still in the Medieval Age and you've got gunpowder, well, who doesn't like that? Let's go ahead and grab a democracy next. I like that. Hmm, sulfur. That's really good. Reduce the cost of all siege and artillery units? Heck yes. There we go, merchant. Go get him. Kill him. Steal the furs. Hey, the Colossus is done. Uh, gives me extra population and commerce for wealth and timber goes up. That's not bad. Now, one thing I'm working on right now um, is I'm actually increasing our uh, capacity as far as logging and farms and metalworking through new technologies. And what that's happened, you can see here, even though I haven't trained like any new citizens, maybe just a couple, I'm already back in my commerce cap. And that's just because I'm outright increasing the production per citizen. You don't really have to keep training a ton of new uh, citizens if you don't want to. You really can just focus a lot on technology and all of a sudden you're going to find yourself hitting that economic cap. I mean, even case in point, I just increased my commerce and I'm still at the food cap. That's that's pretty impressive. All right, we're now going into the Enlightenment Age. My personal favorite age in the game and real life, because this is the time where we're going to start really ramping out some good cannons and a lot of really good ranged infantry. Ooh, gems. I'm going to have to kill the Lakota and take their gems. Gosh, I'm a freaking imperialist, aren't I? Do I get another wonder? I mean, we could. The Red Fort's not bad. Uh, Temple call. Yeah, I kind of like the Red Fort. It functions like a fort, which is basically a castle in this game. And there are forts, but I don't usually use them that often. Um, the Red Fort gives a few other advantages as well. But forts are pretty good because they also can extend your national borders like a city does. As well as give you an option for uh, better defense, kind of like a castle. And uh, you can also train up some generals and stuff, which I, I probably should do. But let's be honest, I'm, I'm too lazy to build another building. I don't think I need any defense. I really just need to go on the offense soon. By the way, case in point with that new city that I was building over there, um, I'm not even bothering getting any lumber or more farms. I'm just focusing on metal. Why? Because I'm capped out. There's no reason to get better, um, there's no reason to get better food or wood production until we can increase that commerce cap. It's just interesting how that changes your play style in the game. Let's go ahead and research these, uh, ranged infantry and all of a sudden that's going to change everything. Nothing but guns for everyone. Now, in classic RTS fashion, uh, all military units kind of have a rock, paper, scissors thing to them. You know, some basic infantry will be good against, uh, let's say, uh, archers. Fusiliers, in my case, will be good against uh, cavalry units, or eventually tanks, whenever they get to those. So you have your anti-infantry, you have your anti-tank, and so on. It's the same kind of concept you'd find in a lot of RTS games. Very familiar, still very effective. Alright, we have four bombards, five bombards, sorry. I think now's a good time to start killing the Indians. Um, or Native Americans, sorry. It might be offensive to, to people from India. Well, blame Christopher Columbus. Don't blame me. He's attacking my merchant! Oh, that's definitely not allowed to stand. You've got spears? I've got guns. Let me, let me just train up a few more of them and we'll go kill you. Now, we did just build a supply wagon. Supply wagons are actually important because one of the aspects of this game is something called attrition. Attrition is important because when you go into enemy territory, if you do not have a supply wagon nearby, then your, uh, your units will start taking damage, and that damage is dependent upon how much attrition your opponent has researched, which you can do at a tower, which I haven't bothered building, but... 
It is a thing you can do. So supply wagons will prevent a lot of damage. Otherwise, as you start piercing further and further into enemy territory, your army will get softened up, and that's just kind of a natural defense mechanic. So in my case, these supply wagons will be very important. We need to make sure this guy stays close to my troops, maybe even train up a couple of extras, and uh, definitely keep them close to the um, close to the cannons as well, because we don't want to risk losing either of those. Oh, you're in trouble now, Lakota. I've got musketmen and fusiliers just itching for a fight and cannons, which will quickly reduce your cities to rubble. Not actually how it works. You don't destroy cities, you capture them. Uh, reduce them down to zero health, then get your military in position, and then boom, you take the city. And keep it forever, and it expands your own borders and assimilates into your, uh, into your culture. Kind of like you would see in a game like, I don't know, Civilization. Again, the parallels are there, but I'm not unhappy about it. We're about to conquer Makasika, or however you say that. The cannons are doing their job. Just need to keep an infantry nearby, and... Uh, come on, there we go. Boom! We have captured their capital city. If he does not retake his capital in 3 minutes and 30 seconds, he loses the game automatically. Hey, what's your despot doing over here? I don't like despots. I'm a democracy. We killed him. Well, ransomed him. Whatever. He's got some military units. We'll get in position, but uh, I think I'll let the cannons have their fun and destroy another city. Whoa, okay, I think I found his army. Let's retreat for a minute, and we'll use the cannons to try and uh, hit them from afar. Now, because we're not in enemy territory, my democratic leader, the president, who's got that nice glowing halo over him, uh, his, as long as he's close to my troops, they heal slightly, which is a pretty huge advantage. So, um, yeah, let's keep him around. And I think once the cannons are set up, they'll make short work of these guys. Oh, dear, oh, dear. I seem to have gotten a little overly aggressive with my cavalry. Uh, I, I didn't think you still had an army. I thought I wiped them all out. Okay, um, set up and kill them if you can. In the meantime, my army is on their way. Um, we've sacked another city, so it's probably still worth it, but yeah, that was a goof. Hey, welcome to the Industrial Age. Anything new that I want? Statue of Liberty is kind of fun. Versailles? Yeah, reduce the cost of all non-knowledge uh, research in the library. Yeah, it could save me a fair bit of resources. It's not terrible. All right, let's go ahead and pick that up. We'll go for Versailles. You can only have one um, wonder per city. Another reason you have to be gradually expanding in this game. All right, well, the good news is my cannons and infantry appear to have destroyed Crazy Horse. Oh, you crazy, crazy horse, you. We're just going to conquer the rest of your cities, destroy your military industry, and then I'm just going to move on to the next person. Infantry and artillery for the win. Super strong. Oh, my gosh. King Philip of Spain has only reached the gunpowder age. I'm in the freaking industrial age, making good progress toward the modern age, and he's only now researching gunpowder? I seem to have spiraled out of control. Or maybe, maybe spiral's not what I was trying to say. Ramped. That's it. I've ramped out of control. Whatever. Aw, oh, Suleiman, work on those pyramids. Good luck. I'm building Versailles. I'm gonna try building a whole bunch of new uh, barracks in my new city. Reason being, I just want to have some military stuff a little bit closer to the front lines. It's a little bit faster when training up more troops. All right, he's got a castle, but I have howitzers, or whatever. Blow it up! Ooh, aluminum. If I ever wanted to go down the aircraft route, that'd be fine, but let's be honest, I think this game's gonna be over long before I have any uh, meaningful number of planes and bombers, though they are very effective. Never doubt it. Guns, uh, so planes and bombers, pretty good in this game. Pretty darn good. We can actually get oil production, too. We do need to do things like that. Oil is important if we wanted to build tanks, battleships, and so on. Uh, but more importantly for me, I think it'll be important for uh, some other research. So I'm not really expecting to tech switch over to over to any naval or uh, air base stuff. Mostly because I'm lazy. But it would be very effective. Hmm, looks like the Turks are over here already, taking over Santander. Or however you're supposed to say that. That's fine. Um, I'll take this city from you, too. But at this point, I mean, as long as we keep reinforcing the army, um, I think we've already kind of hit our uh, our unstoppable death ball. So much artillery, we can shred through any cities or fortresses in the way. Enough our infantry to make sure that we mow down any new opponents. This is why I liked the uh, infantry-artillery combos. Gosh, I should have been a, st a student of Napoleon Bonaparte. That's what he liked, right? Lots of infantry and cannons? I think so, but I might be talking crap. Ah, Madrid, the capital of Spain. All right, so if we conquer the city, then we have... Oh, look, a bunch of spearmen. Wow, what do you freaking know? By capturing his capital, now we just have to hold on for two minutes. We can hold on for two minutes, he loses. Or we can just conquer his last city. I think he has one left, um, which would be very easy for me to deal with, but 
Even so, you get the point. We can turtle up now if we want to. Very difficult for an opponent to unseat someone once they've gotten their capital. A little dangerous. Don't look now, cannons, but I think there might be a city up here somewhere. Where could it be? Right in this tiny little pocket? Oh, hello. There it is. Wow, these guys really do have terrible vision, don't they? All right, well, we'll just set up right here. Don't mind me. And say goodbye to King Philip II. All right, that just leaves Suleiman and the Turks. I think we can handle that, though he is technically the most advanced out of all of them. Ooh, look, a fort. We can get him, though. We can get him. Oh, yeah, let's research capitalism. Uh, I for totally forgot that we were still just a lowly democracy. In the modern age. Who would have thunk? Let's go to the information age. Yeah. Territory victory in four minutes. If you conquer, like, three quarters of the map, it doesn't matter if you have any opponents. You just win automatically. So the real question is, can I actually beat this guy in less than four minutes? Just to say that we can. And we're in the information age. Okay. We have access to howitzers and all the fun stuff now. Rocket artillery is on the way. And then we can really rain death. It takes, like, no time at all for my artillery to set up. Now, the cool thing is, once you do get to the information age and you have all technology, uh, there's some really cool stuff you can get. You know, for example, if you go for um, uh, futuristic science tech, which you might actually end up doing, I'm not sure yet, uh, all units will be trained instantly. It's like artificial intelligence or something like that. You know, there's different bonuses. Uh, I think the um, max level future military tech is a missile shield, so your enemies can't use uh, ICBMs or anything, which is a whole new aspect of the game we haven't even had to bother with because the infantry combo with the uh, artillery is so strong, but still. Yeah, lots of cool stuff you can do with future tech, if you wanted to. For me personally, I'm happy just raining death from above. Oh, this is fun. World government. So we'll pick that up, because if we do, then all assimilation bonuses and like uh, victory timers are instant. I don't think we can research it in time. Futuristic technology takes a long time, but if we did, theoretically, I think we would just straight up win, like right now, instantly. Only a few more seconds to go. You know one of the things that's really shocking me right now is I'm actually really having fun. Like, this is an old game that I played when I was a kid, and I am having a lot of fun playing this right now. I could totally see myself playing some more of this in my spare time, and I wouldn't feel bad about it at all. In fact, I may very well do that. Victory is mine! A 38-minute game. Not too bad. Well, that was amazingly fun. I have loved Rise of Nations. I really do need to play this some more. Uh, the campaigns are actually really good, too. Uh, you not only have to play each of these maps, but you have kind of an overarching larger map where you're moving armies between provinces, conquering those, getting more economic benefits, which you can use to fuel a larger army and so on. It's pretty cool. And then when you get to the Cold War, you actually enter into um, uh, Armageddon and spies and a lot of those kind of covert missions like you'd find in the Cold War period. Really cool stuff. I love Rise of Nations. It is a great game. Cannot recommend it enough. Definitely one of my top favorites when I was a kid, and it remains that way to this day. Thank you all for watching. I do hope that you enjoyed. If so, then be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. And I will see you guys next time. <laughs>